certain behavior uh, that I insist has characterized the history of humankind to date. And then let's very briefly ponder uh, whether or not that analysis may help us move in directions uh, that are useful and productive vis-a-vis -vis the future of the species. And then let's hope that I shut up and we can have some snacks uh, and talk to each other. All right, let's start with Darwin and the theory of evolution that I think everyone here has at least a rudimentary familiarity with. Uh, as you know, Darwin argued uh, that all forms of life share in common a biological predisposition towards self-preservation uh, in the service of survival and reproduction. I think that's pretty straight ahead. Darwin just said that living things like to keep living. Uh, and that that's something that we share uh, with every other living thing on the planet. But what Darwin also said is that there's a, a really fantastic and diverse a variety of really elegant and clever ways that different forms of life uh, have been able to adapt to the demands of their physical surroundings in order to be able to survive and prosper. And, and so to use some silly examples, we could think about the turtle. It's not going to win any races in the Olympics, and yet a uh, turtle's got something going for it, and that's the shell that it can just duck into and hide whenever it needs to. It comes in pretty handy. Uh, we can think about, oh, I don't know, the eagle. It's got pretty good vision. Supposedly an eagle can read the date off a penny from the air. I don't know who's determined that, uh, but uh, being able to see has definitely helped that creature out fairly well. Uh, dogs have a good sense of smell, as anyone who has one will attest. The point that Becker makes, uh, and that Darwin was also very painfully aware of, is that if you contrast human beings uh, with most other forms of life, what you find is that uh, we're quite frighteningly and almost pathetically impoverished when you just look at our physical attributes. The, the average human is a monstrous spectacle, starting from minute one and then working your way up through the lifespan. There's nothing more heinous. There's baby Olive there. Uh, can't roll over, can't sit up, can't grab the cell phone and dial out for a pizza. Com completely unable to engage in even the most rudimentary of instrumental behaviors. But even the more mature uh, amongst us are, are not particularly well suited, according to Darwin, to function independently and autonomously by virtue of our physical attributes. We're not excessively large creatures, not overly fast creatures. Our eyesight, mine especially these days, is getting quite impoverished. Our sense of smell, terrible. We don't have sharp teeth, don't have especially sharp claws. The point is, is that there's no way we would be sitting here today if we had to survive by virtue of our individual physical attributes. Well, what do we have going for us? Well, according to Darwin and according to Becker, we've got two things that are especially handy. We've got the fact that we're especially social or gregarious creatures. And we've also got the fact that we're pretty intelligent, although let's not be too homocentric here. Intelligence is vastly overrated. Unabomber's a smart guy, but that doesn't mean that we want to honor him for that. But let's, uh, I, di I digress just a bit, but let's talk about uh, human beings both being highly social creatures as well as vastly intelligent creatures. The point that Becker wants to make is that it's those two things that are, render us alive today. Uh, on the one hand, we're social creatures. None of us can survive by ourselves, uh, but when we cooperate with each other in the service of constructing a host of elaborate institutions that facilitate our collective survival, uh, we can do great. So we, we've got, we can't make it by ourselves, but we've got hospitals, uh, we've got schools, we've got takeout Chinese food, all the important things uh, that we need uh, in order to be able to, to make it on our own. We also have the fact that we're pretty bright. And, and one of the things that Becker wants us to marvel at, and he takes this idea from one of his major influences, that being a guy named Otto Rank, it is the notion that human beings are so smart that we can actually imagine things that don't yet exist and then have the audacity to transform our dreams into reality. Ronk has one of my favorite phrases. He says, human beings make the unreal real. 
Uh, and uh, let's note that, uh, without again getting too far afield, uh, that human beings are indeed the only creative form of life on the planet. Plenty of other creatures are quite bright, but those creatures, for better or worse, uh, must adapt to the world in the form in which they originally encounter it. Uh, only human beings, to borrow a phrase from Nancy Reagan, just say no to reality uh, and instead conjure up their image of the way they would like the world to be and then actually transform it in accordance with their desires. I hope it's obvious that uh, that's one of the reasons why human beings have proliferated and thrived in a wide variety of environmental circumstances uh, that would not otherwise be fit for human habitation. Well, the point that Becker makes is that we need to sit on this idea and we need to take Darwin's notion that we're social creatures and intelligent creatures and we now need to combine it with the ideas of the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard who in the 1840s pointed out that there's something interesting about humans and that is that we're so smart that we know that we're here. All right, without technical language, we can call this notion self-awareness, we, we can call it self-consciousness, uh, call it whatever you want. But what Kierkegaard pointed out is that we're so smart that we know that we're here. I've actually gotten a little squeamish about this because when I'm at Skidmore, I, I often I ask my classes, I say, look, this is not a trick question, but how many of you are aware of the fact that you're here right now, either listening to me or wondering about when I'll stop droning so we can have some snacks. And I, you know, I'm, I'm like, raise your hands if you know that you're here. Can I get some hands? Just a rhetorical question. All right, good. I got about 50%, and that's about what I get uh, at Skidmore. In, in more friendly venues, I can get almost everybody to admit that they know that they're here. Uh, and the point that Kierkegaard wants to make is that a blade of grass is here but doesn't know that it's here. An insect is here but doesn't know that it's here. I'm not going to get in any debates with you about whether your cat knows that it's here or your dog knows that it's here. All I would insist for present purposes is that you're here, at least some of you, no, you're all here, but, but most of you uh, will admit that you're here. And, and what Kierkegaard said is, look, the minute that you know that you're here, uh, you experience as a human being two uniquely human emotions that he designated as awe and dread, respectively. So Kierkegaard said, yo, it's awesome and dreadful to be here and know it. All right, now on the awesome side of things, and let's not lose track of this because I think ultimately it may be our salvation, Kierkegaard said, you know what? There's something spectacular about being alive and knowing it. And that each one in our better moments enjoys just the sublime privilege and joy that comes from the recognition of our very existence. Who's, who's ever had it? It's another one of those rhetorical questions. All right, I did better than you admitting you're here. This is great. So you can admit that every once in a while you have one of these magic moments. You wake up. It's a beautiful day, you walk outside, you get a face full of fresh air, you see like the sun glancing off a flower, and you're like, oh my God, it is fucking tremendous just to exist. Now you didn't do anything great that day, you didn't win a Nobel Prize, you didn't win the lottery, and fortunately, uh, because the best things in life are indeed free, uh, that's quite unnecessary, because you are really just basking in the ultimate human prerogative, which is to be alive and to know it. That's awesome. Uh, and only in America is it tough to get people to admit that it's, it's great to be alive, but let's leave that issue uh, aside for just a moment. The point that Kierkegaard makes is that it's awesome to be alive and, and to know it. But for Kierkegaard and for Becker, it's also dreadful to be alive and to know it. Kierkegaard's point is that unless you're a child or an idiot, if you're intelligent enough to know that you're here, you are also intelligent enough to recognize that you'll not always be here. And so very simply, Kierkegaard called it the paradox of finitude in the context of infinitude. On the one hand, 
We have a mind that is literally capable of transporting us across time and space. Who's ever thought about what it might be like back in the days of the dinosaur? Or is that just me? Or, or back in the days of the Roman Colosseum? I usually put myself in the stands as opposed to... Uh, uh,